Uh, good afternoon. This is Jay Rosa Pepe, and this is July 17th Land Use Committee uh, meeting. I've already introduced myself. Uh, if everybody else would introduce themselves, it'd be appreciated. Eric Warden, City Council, seat four. Scott, you are muted. Scott, can you hear it? There you are. Yeah, sorry. Um, the dual screens lost my mouse for a moment. Uh, Scott Diener, council member, position three. And Nick Bond, the community development director for the city. Jim, this principal planner. Uh, we have a set agenda. Uh, does anybody want to add an item to the agenda? Okay. Um, I would like to add at least uh, item number five, uh, if we have any update on non-conforming, uh, are we still waiting back for information uh, from legal on that? Uh, legal is going to be pre preparing a white paper in time for our August meeting, if we choose to have an August meeting. Um, otherwise, it will be sent uh, for September. Okay, well, that was the update. Uh, we'll discuss the meeting uh, as item five. Uh, after after we get done with our agenda. So you want to go ahead, Nick and Jim? Sure, I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, in your packet, you'll uh, you'll notice that we uh, presented some some alternatives for the Bethel uh, sub area plans. Uh, we have two sub areas planned uh, or are in the planning process through the comp plan update. Um, Bethel one and Sedgwick Bethel. Um, both of these areas are fairly similar in size, um, have commercial anchors um, and, and should meet the, the center's criteria for PSRC. So we are planning to have a workshop on July 24th. Uh, that's next Wednesday at the library. It begins promptly at six o'clock. You are all invited to attend. Um, in your packet, you'll notice uh, there's three alternatives. There's status quo where we really don't have any change. Uh, compact growth where we introduce a little bit of zoning changes, some height increases, things like that. And then alternative three, which is transit oriented development, which is, is a bit more intense than alternative two. So we intend to uh, have a presentation to the public, kind of explaining all of these alternatives and then seeking feedback from them. Additionally, um, after, after the close of the workshop, we will uh, have a survey online through Social Pinpoint. It's the same uh, software that we've used uh, in our other workshops, it's been quite effective. Um, and so we're trying to gain the, uh, the public's feedback and anybody can participate uh, uh, online and in person. So um, after that, after we get some feedback, kind of finalize those plans, um, next steps moving forward, we anticipate having a uh, full comp plan draft in front of the planning commission sometime in August. We, we may need to move that meeting back a little bit in August, uh, just because of the council chambers and, and, and the workload for that matter. Um, and then we are hopeful that in September, uh, we can have a public hearing with the planning commission and start moving it toward, um, toward the council. So um, you'll see more of this uh, at the September Land Use Committee. Scott, go ahead. So in terms of alternative three, what are the indicators in terms of transit-oriented transit development, TOD, um, that makes Bethel ripe for this proposal? Well, I, I think that you're probably going to end up somewhere in between alternative two and alternative three. Mm -hmm. um, but most of this is based on Kitsap Transit's um, long-range plan. Um, so they, they have some plans for Bethel as we have those corridor improvements, that sort of thing. There are no, what we would call um, major transit uh, stops that, that were part of HB 1110. We just don't have that. So um, this, this kind of would focus uh, development uh, along Bethel, along those stops that they have planned. So it's not really TOD in the, in the true sense. Not in the traditional it's... sense. Now I, I should point out that the, the, 
Kitsap Transit plan is for bus rapid transit in the Bethel corridor. But of course, that isn't something that they have funded at this point. And so right. this alternative really aligns with a potential funding alternative in the future. And um, in terms of the alternatives, I think for each of these criteria, we're likely to cobble together a preferred alternative that may include pieces of alternative one and pieces of alternative two and pieces of alternative three, sort of as we see fit. I, I kind of I, my, I, I hope I have a pretty good gut feeling of, of where council is at on most of these things. And so I've already gone through and kind of circled the ones that I think we're going to end up with as a preferred alternative. But of course, we want to hear from the public and what they think um, before before jumping to any conclusions. Okay. And so the, the that's what I kind of suspected, or at least I hoped for. But let's say that that alternative three was just chosen outright. Would that inform on any changes to the Bethel corridor design today? Um, it it potentially could. Um, we when we did the Bethel corridor plan, we uh we built in some pretty aggressive growth assumptions into that modeling. Um, our um our transportation consultant on the comprehensive plan is actually holding off on updating the transportation model until we pick the alternative for the sub area plans. And so we're going to rerun the modeling and we will share that with our design consultant to verify um, that that the road design as currently configured still works with whichever alternative we're going to pick. Um, I think that in terms of height limits, um, we're likely to stick with uh, either an alternative one or alternative two, because I think alternative three likely does push us uh, to a place where you would need a uh, additional travel lanes um, in the Bethel corridor. So just to follow up on that and then and then I'll be quiet. What what are some examples of the improvements we would need for Bethel? Uh, would it be pullouts or stops or what what would we need to see to to make alternative three feasible? Well if you remember um when we looked at the three alternatives for the Salmonberry roundabout, one of them was a four lane roundabout uh, or two lanes in each direction roundabout rather than a single lane roundabout. Uh -huh. We went away for that because our modeling indicated that we that the roundabout would function as a two or a four lane and essentially adding the capacity there isn't going to increase the throughput of the overall corridor. Right. So um, it's possible that 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 intersection could drop to a level of service that is not acceptable if we added more density in the corridor. It's also possible that the entire corridor would need to go to a, a two-lane road in, in each direction, which I think is um is is not, you know, when we looked at the cost of of that as part of the 2018 study, I mean it was like 30 or 40 million dollars in additional cost to do a project like that. So we we chose we we will live within our road design rather than designing our road to meet additional capacity that we are not obligated to provide, I, I think is the answer. You good? Okay. You, you good for a minute? I'm good. Okay, so a couple of my questions. Um, and, and that's where I thought we were on the road design that we were, we were holding. I mean, rapid transit, you know, the model is as few as stops as possible. So um, I could understand not wanting to do the pull-offs. My two questions were, um, we don't have, as opposed to the downtown, uh, we don't have any height restrictions as such in our in our building for the Bethel Corridor, do we? Just just what is uh, permitted outright by the zone. So for the most part, that's a 35-foot height limit, but there's no view protection or, or increase like in downtown. Okay. And when we look at something like uh, compact growth uh, on that, uh, are we looking at any uh, infrastructure that we would need to add besides what we've already planned for? Well, the, oh. the corridor, yeah. is. this is served by West Sound Utility District, so it's not our water and sewer, it's West Sound. And so we're going to ask West Sound for their input on this as well. But my understanding is West Sound's challenges are more with distribution than they are with uh, supply. But I, but I, I don't know how... Um, uh, I don't know what's what's in the latest West Sound Utility District uh, water system plan in terms of water rights and whatnot. Um, but in terms of other capacity, I mean, stormwater uh, isn't a significant issue here. It, it really is just transportation that the city is mostly concerned with. And then a little bit parks. 
Um, and, and that's a, a, also a major theme within the uh, sub area plans is trying to figure out uh, what kind and, and if parks will be provided in this general area because there are no public parks other than the regional park that the county operates, which is uh, more than a mile away from uh, exactly. the Lund Center and it's two miles away from the, the Sedgwick Center. Do we have any requirements for parks it, it within the, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, developers have been putting in amenities, but do we have anything for a area park? We do. The, the parks plan identifies future park facilities as being needed in this area. And so the I, I believe that the sub area plan calls out and identifies some kind of general locations where they could be located without being so prescriptive as, as to say, we're going to buy this property um, because, you know, I don't think we want to alarm homeowners that their property is slated to become a park. Um, but it's it's really, we need a park in this general, you know, area or radius from a, a point more so than on a specific property. And then the parks plan also identifies the types of improvements that are needed in this area. And um, things like, I, I remember the skate dot where it's kind of like not a full size skate park, but like a little skateboard you know, area where kids can hang out um, was one of the types of features that was identified here. Um, I think tennis and pickleball courts are probably a, another big one, but um, our, our parks impact fee is designed to collect park uh, impact fees for that would contribute to parks in this area and the, the creation of parks in this area. Okay, and I try to add too, um, our, our municipal code already requires the dedication of parkland as part of a subdivision, and depending on how many lots you create that right. that influences how big it is and commercial development multifamily uh, the design standards require some open space yeah thank you uh eric yeah i was wondering if if we went to the um transit oriented development part is there uh opportunities for more funding additional funding for that no um i i would say probably not um because we're, we're aiming to meet the minimum criteria to be a countywide center. And by being a countywide center, you are already scoring better in transportation funding competitions than by not being a center. The yeah. next level of center would be more intense than what is allowed in our downtown now. So you'd be talking about major urban development, um, much more typical of like a downtown Tacoma or Bellevue or Seattle um, not not just the level of of development that we even see in downtown Fort Orchard. So I, I that would score even higher and opens up additional sources of funding. But yeah. considering downtown isn't a regional center, I don't think we would want to put a regional center on Bethel. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions on this uh, before we get more feedback from the public? All right. Um, second item. Parks plans for Sherman Avenue Stormwater Park. Yeah, so this is um this is more a, just a an informational discussion, and I want to get uh, the land use committee blessing for um, some outreach that we're intending to do. As you're all aware, we purchased about 30 acres of property um, at the end of Sherman Avenue for a regional stormwater facility with the intent of building. Uh, we have no we have no way to make improvements in the the kind of fireweed neighborhood um, mm -hmm. because we don't have a regional stormwater facility. So we bought the property for stormwater ponds, but there's going to be a lot of unused property that is available for parks. And so when, when the funding was allocated for that purchase, some of the money came from parks and some of it came from our stormwater utility. And I'm going to, um, I'm pulling up a map right now. I'm going to share my screen, Jim. Do I have permission to, to share? Perfect. So the, um, the property that we own is here at the end of Sherman Avenue, and it butts up against Highway 16 and goes almost down to Sedgwick. And our Public Works Department has already done a layout for some stormwater ponds that would be regional ponds that would allow sidewalks and curb and gutter to be extended up Sherman, uh, over Fireweed, and up Sydney, all the way to Lippert. And, and basically, there's a kind of a ridge through here that everything south of the ridge flows south on Sydney and would need to come to this stormwater facility. So the idea is that we could do one or more street projects to bring sidewalks to this neighborhood while also making some small park improvements. Um, and, and some of the park improvements may or may not offset changes in some of our other parks. Like if we wanted to, to make changes to Paul Powers Park, we would want to replace any facilities that are lost in that location in a new location that serves this neighborhood. So um, 
we've just hired, we just finally are fully staffed in our planning department. And we have um, two uh, young planners who are um, uh, very recently out of school and have led in, in academic settings, these planning type exercises. And so um, Jim and I and the mayor talked about uh, having them as kind of a, a project to get familiar with Port Orchard to actually do the, the master planning for a park in Port Orchard where they would do the public outreach piece rather than us hiring a consultant. So the idea is that um, I, I've got Connor and Sean putting together a public participation program that sort of identifies uh, you know, who we're targeting, what forms of outreach need to be conducted, and, and would basically outline a, a six-month to one-year process where we would be doing outreach in the area that's generally um, Blackjack Creek to the um, to the east, Highway 16 to the west, and would stop at Tremont. Basically, everybody within that triangle would get direct mailers to participate in a park planning process for a neighborhood park. We would do outreach beyond that, and of course, anyone in the community can participate in these processes, but we really want to target this neighborhood and try to deliver um, a, a stormwater park project that would, would both extend the ability to provide sidewalks in the area while providing them with, with uh, a better park facility than what they currently have. And so um, we did not want to embark on that or bring forward a public participation program without at least uh, confirming that the 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 land use committee is comfortable with us doing this exercise in-house rather than hiring outside consultants. Okay. Um, so quick question from my side of the coin. Uh, could you, when you, if you could shrink the map just a hair, I can see with your pointer. Nope. Go the other direction. Out? I, I, out. So yeah, not that's far enough. <laughs> uh, so right now, you know, I'm looking at the location and I could see where uh, Cedar Heights was. And so the closest park right now to some of these developments is Van Z, correct? Or is there That's another? Correct. Point? Okay. Yeah. And so, so this would be Van at the opposite Z. end. Yep. And then we have we also have Van Z Park up here. So we have Paul Powers right. and, and Van Z. Yeah. So what? Uh, yeah. So that would be perfectly good. I, I like that because of the, some of the density that's in the area. Uh, in other words, to move forward to it. But I think you hit a key note there that uh, has been good for McCormick Woods Park, and that's where they've been able to tie in access among the various subdivisions to make it safe. Yep. And I think that's a huge key where you were talking about um, uh, sidewalks and, and things like that. So the safety of making it would be just as important to me as a park location there, but I'm 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 fully supportive of that because more parks we have, I think the better uh, we'll see both development and also interest for folks using those. That's my two cents. Scott or Eric? I appreciate Jay what you had to say, and I too am just as supportive. Yeah, uh, currently in Kitsap County, there's four. Uh, there's going to be a four uh, stormwater park going in. Uh, <laughs> the corner of Buckland Hill and uh, Tracenton. Uh, they are all three, um, not just successful in the water quality aspect of it. They are, um, I think it's a huge success when you see the amount of people that are using them. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's a great addition to the city. It's a great addition to water quality. Um, and uh, really looking forward to seeing it come together, it'll get, it'll definitely get utilized. I see it every day. It'll get utilized. So. Hey, Eric, could you send me a, uh, just text me a list of those parks or locations? Oh, abs absolutely. Uh, more, be more than willing to do that for sure. Yes. Okay. I was also going to share, um, Puget Sound Regional Council has a website concerning stormwater parks and they've, um, they've got quite a few resources and I believe this is the Manchester park in photo here. And yes. so um, there's questions about what is a stormwater park? How does it benefit the environment? Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of, of different examples. And so I would encourage you to take a look at those. Um, I was also going to share that, you know, we did McCormick Village Park is the only park in the city where we've done a true park master plan. And so mm -hmm. we're really aiming to follow that playbook where we we meet with the community and we develop alternatives. And, and in that planning exercise, we developed kind of a natural alternative where it would be more of a natural park. We looked at an active alternative and, and eventually after evaluating the pros and cons of the three alternatives and listening to the community, we ended up with kind of a hybrid. And so there was some active features, there were some natural features. 
and and really that's the process that I've sort of directed um, the planners to follow is is we need to develop alternatives, kind of weigh them against one another, and um, and and really let the community tell us exactly what improvements they want, and then um, Connor, um, our our newest planner, his background is can operate AutoCAD very well in landscape plans and conceptual plans. And so my hope is that he's going to be able to create illustrations of each of these alternatives conceptually to kind of show what this would look like. And because we have the base maps for the stormwater design that, that our city engineer did, our assistant city engineer did last year, um, he already knows where the ponds need to be located and kind of what their size is and how much room we have to work with. And so he's going to be able to, to kind of see how, you know, whether tennis or pickleball courts are going to fit and how they could fit uh, within the park and, and at least put, put some visuals together to help the public understand the alternatives. And then the final comment I wanted to make is that we're also planning this Ruby Creek Regional Park and we, you know, we mm -hmm. have couple hundred apartments here, but I think there's a real opportunity either for potentially like a pedestrian bridge that crosses Highway 16 and would tie two parks together, or um, you could potentially connect over to Bravo Terrace and and actually create a way for people to get across Blackjack Creek in a non-motorized capacity here. And so as part of the park planning process, I'm really looking, to, I, I'm, I would really like to evaluate the non-motorized linkages that might be possible. And I think there are some, some pretty um, good federal funding sources for building those types of things, especially uh, freeway crosses where freeways are a barrier in your community. And if we could have a flyover on, on Highway 16 for a pedestrian connection that would come to the transit park and ride and tie this neighborhood to transit, but also allow people to kind of get into nature and experience that Blackjack Creek site, I think you could create a pretty uh, neat linkage. And so that's one of the things I, I hope to explore as part of the, the planning exercise. I, I'm very keen on that and um, would like to hear how that progress goes. I, you know, I think if you're doing a, a, any way to do multimodal connections uh, is for benefit of the city. I wanted to back up for a second, at least give an editorial comment. Um, I certainly feel like McCormick Woods Park, which I believe is only about one third built out from the master plan, uh, has amenities that, um, you know, at, at some point in time, I hope we retrofit some of our parks uh, inside the historic city because uh, it's, you know, I know we're doing the pickleball courts uh, in conjunctions down at uh, Givens. Uh, I know we've done that Van Z, but, you know, when I look at the water feature at, up here and, you know, I think about uh, where I believe, I'm not sure of the street, uh, the DeKalb, uh, park by DeKalb. I was surprised working on a project down there one day and how many kids were using that park. Uh, it was, it was amazing uh, during, you know, mm. for summer. So, you know, it's just put that in the back of your, you know, hip pocket someplace that we just don't make the amenities as we push out that we bring some of those back into our, uh, uh, our core uh, city too. Yep. So much for editorial comment. And, and our the planning the the preparation of this plan is really with an eye for applying for a grant in the 2026 parks funding cycle so provided we do the planning we know what the criteria are now we need to make sure that we can check all the boxes and score well in an application to recreation conservation office or to any other stormwater funding uh, entities that we're able to to pursue grants through so the hope is that this leads to funding in the near future and Nick, that's not that that wasn't a, you know, a, a slam in any idea because, you know, Rockwell Park is definitely a, a, a beautiful addition to downtown. And I don't want to take away from that, uh, acknowledging that either. OK. Oh, no, no worries. Okay. Hey, Nick, uh, is, you talked about scoring criteria is is uh, rate of growth one of those criteria? It is not. Um, I think that. Um, a lot of the points actually come from how you do your outreach and how how the preferred alternative and the site was selected for the feature. And so because this is also a stormwater park, you don't have a lot of choice on where you put those. They need to be at the bottom of a hill um, mm -hmm. so that stormwater flows to them. But in terms of um, how have we determined the community's needs and wants, we can do a really good job of of capturing that information in a in a master planning process you know the, the parks plan is very high level and so we can say that yes we need this many pickleball courts per capita but it doesn't say where they need to go or who you talk to and so this is really an opportunity for us to highlight our planning effort in when we actually go present to the funding board for the the rco eric 
Um, I kind of pulled my pulled my hand back a little bit. I wanted to question what I was going to suggest, um, but I'm just going to put it out there. Um, like the words out that the city is doing this, and it's um, pretty pretty intriguing, pretty inviting. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to just let the city know um, the people who, uh, the folks who originally designed the uh, the first two or three um, local stormwater parks, um, they're retired now. And I know you right away started off with not doing consulting, um, but if, if need be, um, I can pass on a phone number for a conversation. So, okay. um, but sounds like you guys have a really good um, in-house plan, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to discredit that at all. I think you guys have a great idea, and um, moving forward on it sounds 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 fantastic. So, just don't want well, to. Yeah. The public participation plan does call for a steering committee, and so that could include either a council member or outside people who who have expertise. And so, if, okay. if there's somebody who's uh, uh, interested in participating as a member of the public, you know, we yeah, will. I like that. Welcome. I like that. Idea. Never, that never say good. never. So, right. what a wonderful segue into the 2024 uh, 2025 mm -hmm. planning work plan. Sure. So, um, this is actually a, most of what's on this document is taken from an internal document that we have bi weekly meetings to discuss where we're at on various projects. But, um, I, I recently updated the the list to include a lot of our mandate mandate deadlines, and uh, I wanted to share with the land use committee just how many how many deadlines we have in the next uh, a year and a half or so, and and that you're going to be reviewing all of this stuff as the land use committee. And I wanted to give you a preview of of what's to come. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through each of the high level bullet items. Um, the comprehensive plan, I think all of you are familiar with. Um, I did want to remind you that we're going to be at the farmer's market on Saturday, um, just doing some final outreach before we head into public hearings. Um, we also have an open house on the sub area plan, as Jim mentioned earlier, and we're we're aiming to open the public hearing on the comp plan in August or possibly September. Um, we're not sure the council chambers are going to be ready for our normal August meeting, and so we're either going to have to schedule a special meeting or um, wait until September uh, to start the public hearing process. And then we're tentatively slated to bring the full comp the full comprehensive plan to work study in September um, at your your third meeting or your third uh, Tuesday in September. And that has to this whole project has to be wrapped up by December thirty first, twenty twenty four. Um, as part of the comp plan, but as separate actions, we will be bringing forward an ordinance to adopt a new critical areas code. And we're just about to uh, release the draft critical areas code, and we'll be doing some outreach with the home builders. And um, uh, we've already been meeting with Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so we'll have something to, to share on that real soon. There's also going to be some minor zoning code changes and also some zoning map changes consistent with the comprehensive plan, which we've reviewed with you previously. And then once the comp plan is adopted, we have to go to KRCC and get these centers recognized where we've done sub area plans. So our Ruby Creek Center and our Bethel Lund and our Bethel Sedgwick centers once KRCC recognizes them as countywide centers, they will score higher in our grant applications going forward. But there's a process we have to go through at KRCC to get them to review our plans and agree that we have met the requirements of, of being designated as countywide centers. Um, I, you should all remember we just passed a contract on an impact fee study update, which would result in a ch update to our impact fee schedule for transportation. And so um, we're, we're working through that with a target of February of 2025. But the other thing the legislature did this last uh, uh, couple of years on housing is they, they're they requiring us to charge impact fees based on either trips generated by projects or the number of bedrooms within a residential unit rather than per unit. And so both the school district, the parks uh, fee schedule is very close to meeting the law. We currently charge park impact fees based on persons per household estimates from OFM, we have to tweak that schedule ever so slightly so that it's so that it's either by bedroom or by, um, I, I think it has to be by bedroom or square footage. 
And then school impact fees, the school district charges based on whether something is multifamily or single family, which does not meet the requirements of the law. And so we've let the district know that they need to update their school impact fee schedule so that they are charging per bedroom or per square foot, not, not based on the type of, of housing unit. There's another bill that takes effect, uh, Senate Bill 5290. We have to update our code concerning permit processing timelines, and we're also going to have new reporting requirements for showing how we comply with this new law. Um, we have a draft ordinance that we've just gotten from our attorney that we're reviewing internally, and we're hoping to release that publicly uh, in the next 60 days or so. Um, that has to be adopted by the end of this year. We also are going to have a bill from SmartGov because we have to configure features that we don't currently use in SmartGov to help us track compliance with this new bill. Um, we've talked to you previously about middle housing, and we, we brought forward a middle housing memo, I think, in April. And so the work on that continues with a, a, a deadline of June 30th, 2025. We also have new requirements concerning accessory dwelling units. And so we have to tweak our accessory dwelling unit code uh, also by June 30th, 2025. Um, we're also working with Kitsap County and I know council member Diener, you're involved in this professionally, but we're, we're working on basic plans for ADUs so that anybody in the county can take a plan off the shelf, submit it for a permit without having to hire an architect. And so uh, the RFQ is on the street right now where we're looking for architects to help us design some model ADUs and carriage houses with ADUs above a garage where um, people would be able to use those plans. Um, our department is also still leading the community event center design. And so we're we're working to get the shoreline permitting completed this summer. We're in review with the Corps of Engineers and the Th Department of Fish and Wildlife right now. And so we're hoping to have all the permitting wrapped up by the end of this year, and then to bid the project in late 2026, um, once the bank is is under construction with their building and, and we know that they have a, a, a tentative move out date that would allow us to start construction. And stop hey, me if you have any questions. Oh. I got, I got a quick question. Where are we in the in the overall permitting process as far as uh, the uh, lift station and then um, is is the bank ready to pull their permit and where where are we with all of that? What, Could you so remind me the marina lift station? We, yeah, well, that's just part of the project. Um, I'm just curious about an update on where we are with all of these. I know that so they're, they've got to be coordinated, but I'm just curious what's the latest. So Kitsap Bank applied for building permits and their shoreline permits. Mm -hmm. They waived their permitting timeline, their, their right to have a decision within 120 days because they're waiting for us to confirm the elevation of Bay Street so that they don't have to make changes to their, their plans. Right. And so Chris Hammer is working on our Bay Street design. And as soon as WashDOT says, yes, these elevations are approved, that will give the bank the certainty to proceed with the plans that they've submitted without making revisions to their, to their plans before we approve them. So um, the bank's on hold on their building permit review pending confirmation of building elevation. Their shoreline permit will be uh, will be heard at the exact same hearing as or the same same date anyway as our community event center shoreline hearing. And so we're looking to bring those together as a pair one after another to the hearing examiner because they're related projects. And because um, I think the mayor reported on the the overwater structure grading recently, and we're trying to get confirmation from Fish and Wildlife on what they're going to allow so that we can update our shoreline permit package to reflect what Fish and Wildlife says is possible before going to hearing. So I had hoped to go to hearing this month. I think we're likely at the end of August or early September now for both the bank and the uh, community event center as far as our shoreline permits. Nice. Um, do you know when Chris expects to hear from WASDOT? Um, probably... Probably not until October or November, because I think I think WashDOT's going to have to review a 60% plan set and give us comments on it before we know that they are not telling us to change the elevation. So um, I, I think it will not occur until they actually get to review the plans. And I don't think we've I don't even think we've gotten our 30% plans yet. So okay. we're, we're still a few months away. All right. Well, the hearing, the upcoming hearing is pretty exciting. That's a huge step. Yeah, I had hoped to have it done by now, but now that I know that we're changing things for fish and wildlife, I don't want to go forward to the hearing examiner with materials that are we know to be incorrect at this point. Right. 
Thank you very much. Sure. Um, another project the mayor has asked us to work on, and Eric, I don't know if you you know about our 640 Bay Street property, but in 2014, when the, the Mexican restaurant burned down at the corner of Frederick, it was mm -hmm. in foreclosure, and we bought that out of foreclosure from the bank. Um, the bank would really like us to market this property and put a sign up that says, you know, redevelopment opportunity. Um, and, and we previously did a request for proposals looking for a developer who would come up with a plan and buy that from us to redevelop it. Um, so now that Connor is here and we have somebody with great graphic skills, we've got him putting together an updated marketing package for that property. They would just talk about the potential development, um, any incentives that are available and basically say, hey, this is available. If you're interested, please come talk to the city. And um, ultimately, you know, one of the challenges is that there are two privately held properties between the bank's parking lot and 640 Bay Street. And any developer who's going to do something likely needs to buy those properties in order to 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 move forward. And so, um, but at a minimum, we would we would at least have some information on the property available to someone. Yeah, See, wasn't there, oh, sorry. Wasn't there a, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, a Kitsap Sun article on that? lot right there with a local developer possibly there was there was yeah but, but whatever happened with that i'm just curious so they they lost their earnest money and didn't perform so we had a purchase and sale agreement that included milestones they were the only person that submitted and um they they didn't move forward and the concept they put forward actually the library was going to go on the ground floor of that building and yeah. since then we got the pfd money to build the community event center and so the whole idea of a library as a tenant there uh evaporated and so um we did the downtown master plan in 2021 that called for uh that entire block to be redeveloped as one project that would include underground parking and so that parking would be available for merchants during the day and for residents at night and, um, you know, it's um, I've suggested that either the bank or the city needs to consider buying the remaining properties on that block, because I don't think a developer is going to come in and speculatively spend a million or two million dollars buying property um, without an agreement with the city. And the city doesn't want to agree with the developer to develop the whole block if we don't have willing sellers. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg thing where the property really needs to be in, in common ownership or if the bank and the, the city were the common owners, I think we could enter into an agreement to sell it as one package to a developer. Yeah, I have a follow-up if it's okay, Jay. Um, yeah, for thanks. Uh, with that, I might've, yeah, I might've just been thinking about it. Uh, what is the, I don't know the name of the road, I apologize, uh, next, next to that, the hillside right there, the parking. Um, what, was that included in the development? Were they going to pick up that that road right there as well? Yeah, the, the purchase and sale that we had entered into included the possibility of vacating half of Frederick Street and making it wow. like a pedestrian stair climb. Um, okay. But I'm actually, I'm pulling up, I've got the, um, I was going to show you what we had from uh, a few years ago here. Would that, yeah. would that, uh, would that still be in play? Yeah, yeah. I think there's no reason that Frederick couldn't be vacated, except that there is on-street parking on Frederick that needs to be replaced as part of a project, in all likelihood. Um, so I think that um, I think that that would be the the biggest barrier. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you. Just, and yeah, just to go back a little bit. Go ahead, Scott. I'll do no, no, no. Go ahead. I think mine. Uh, I'm awaiting what Nick is going to pull up. Oh, I'm no. still looking for the file, so go go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to say that that you know we had en entered in with a agreement with the developer who had plans, and that didn't come to fruition. Uh, and you know Nick's 100 right about um, you know people are looking for packaging or being able to get the properties, uh, but uh, again we kind of. We're, we're not in the business of help, you know, of giving money to businesses. Uh, so they've got to come with their, uh, their money too to the project and that didn't happen. So, so, so the, um, this is an example of uh, before we got money from the PFD to do 
a project GGLO, the bank's architect, put together a master plan concept. And mm -hmm. this is the marketing material packet that they put together saying that, there, hey, there's a development opportunity. Um, they talked about the mixed use opportunity location, kind of what was in our master plan, you know, how, you know, from a plan, from a um, side view, like how the parking would be underground and kind of tucked into the hillside and, and also the the road improvements that the city is making. So they they took a stab at, at making marketing materials. And so the problem is, is that this concept uh, had the community event center going where the 7-Eleven and the port properties are rather than over here where, where the bank building is. And so all of the illustrations here are outdated. So I've asked um, Connor, our intern, to kind of take a look at what GGLO put together as far as marketing materials, refresh it, and, um, and then just share... Uh, share that with, uh, or, or put that into a marketing package. And then let's make one sign that just has one graphic on it that we could put on the property saying this property is available, you know, talk to uh, talk to the mayor or uh, whoever the designated point of contact is. Go ahead, Scott. Well, maybe I'm remembering it. It's been a while, I'm remembering it differently, but I thought the underground parking was somewhat integral to the bank's needs. Well, the the underground parking is integral to the bank's needs, but they but their needs are met by the surface parking lot that's there now. So as long as they have the surface lot or underground parking, they're they're happy. Um, yeah. Okay. But if we're going to have redevelopment, we need a structured parking that includes dedicated parking for the bank during the day, and then residents can use that that parking at night. Um, I was just pulling up the. Uh, I've got some some other graphics here. This is the. Uh, yeah, I, while you're looking, pulling that up, I'll just say that, uh, as Jay says, I'll editorialize a little bit. I, I don't think we can afford to lose any parking downtown. Um, we constantly, not we, us, but um, it seems like there's a constant chipping away at parking requirements and number of parking spaces available in communities all over. And, and I think, um, I don't think that that's wise to leap into so fast, but that's just my experience. Yeah. So this is the this is a, a larger presentation that GGLO put together for the bank a few years ago, but it it kind of mapped out where parking would be and did parking stall counts and actually did a layout for the parking stalls. And so this would be the underground level with uh, it doesn't say how many stalls are here, but I could count them up. It's probably seventy five or so, um, and then slightly fewer stalls on the next level. And then when you get a level above that, there's still more parking before um, you get to the plaza level where then, then the parking is concealed beneath this plaza that goes between the two buildings and has a stair climb. And of course, the orientation of this stair climb now aligns with Orchard Street rather than with Prospect Street heading out more to the west. All right, uh, nothing else and uh, multifamily tax exemption. Well, I, there's still more on the list. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were... <laughs> No, no, we just- I saw that, it's like, God, you guys have a, 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 a amazing plan here. Yeah, sorry. yeah, we uh, no, sorry, we, we dove really deep into that issue. You did. Uh, there are four development agreements we're still working on. Um, Home Depot, um, we sent them a draft development agreement three months ago, and we're still waiting for feedback from them. Kitsap Transit for the park and ride at Ruby Creek. Um, basically, we're outlining they're going to build all of the frontage improvements. They're going to dedicate park property, and we're obligated to give them impact fee credits and uh, transportation impact or impact fee credits for parks and transportation that could be extended to their future development pad. So when they sell their remnant properties to a developer in the future, they would get credit for the improvements that transit builds along the frontage and then also for the dedication of parkland along Blackjack Creek. Salmonberry Apartments, that's the, uh, the Home Depot connector. They're gonna dedicate some land for right of way in exchange for a transportation impact fee credit. That's uh, those apartments are just just east of Bethel on Salmonberry. And then the Blueberry Apartments, this one actually, um, it, the building is under construction. The agreement's already approved. We're just still continuing to execute on the terms of that agreement uh, because there's a lot of work that we have to do in terms of getting deeds to uh, some right of way they're dedicating. Nick, real quick with the Blueberry Apartments, um, they're really pumping them out right now. I actually yeah. like I actually like the look of them, um, pretty modern. Is there going to be any uh, commercial in there, or is it going to be just strictly um, strictly, strictly residential? Okay, boy. Yep. Um, the Givens Park 
uh, sport court project. We're hoping to bid that within the next 60 days. And um, the bid documents are supposed to be here tomorrow. So um, we're very close to issuing permits and having that ready to go out the door. We just have to get the blessing from our grant funding agency. And I believe the Rotary is going to be making a presentation of their donation uh, here in the next two weeks. We're working on um, another RCO grant application asking for a half a million dollars for the plaza downtown. And then, as I mentioned, the Stormwater Park, we're aiming for a grant application in 2026. And then uh, we were thinking about applying for a grant also to do a, a Givens Park master plan or possibly funding the master plan in the budget and then applying for a grant to implement some of the things in the Givens Park master plan in 2026. Um, we just got, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, or I was talking to Eric before the meeting about this, but the uh, the city's new NPDES permit, that's National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, I think is the S. Um, we The planning department has five mandates or five items that we're going to be at least partially responsible for. We now have to do some mapping associated with both tree canopy and underserved communities in terms of, I guess, stormwater challenges where, where maybe drainage doesn't work well. One of the areas that comes to mind is off of Arnold, um, where we have some flooding issues. Um, we're required to map all of our stormwater outfalls. That will probably fall to public works. Um, but we also have to now have a tree canopy co code with tree mm -hmm. canopy goals. And so um, I'm following very closely the tree canopy proposal that the county is putting forward because I think it would be a, a great improvement on our own current significant tree regulations and would also help us comply with our NPDES permit. And then finally, we have to go through our code again and look for barriers to low impact development integration and uh, make changes to our code in response to that. I also just got noticed that the next round of Shoreline Master Program updates, they're doing rulemaking right now that we'll be monitoring with, uh, we're going to have to update our Shoreline regulations by June 30th, 2029. And then also in 2029, we'll be at our five-year comprehensive plan uh, mid-cycle check-in. And so... Uh, so those are the things that are on my radar for the next uh, five years, but uh, a whole lot of these are are within the next one year, uh, just a ton of deadlines and mandates that we have to meet. And I just wanted you all to know all of the things I'm going to ask you to look at in the near future. And, and Pretty impressive. Huh? How many how many staff now in DCD? We have um, 17 FTEs. There's five permit center staff, two code enforcement. Um, we have uh, three building staff plus five on-call consultants. Um, we have a parking enforcement. Well, we have two part-time parking enforcement officer positions, and I'm going to be uh, putting in requests as part of budget concerning our parking enforcement. And um, five planners, including myself, uh, I'm a, I'm a planner who also directs or a director with a planning problem. I'm not sure which. Yeah. <laughs> who, who do you have a floodplain administrator on staff? That's our bill. It falls to our building department. So um, we don't have a lot of floodplain development. in right. Orchard. I mean, yeah. more coastal flooding than uh, river flooding. And there's, there's so little developable land along Blackjack Creek. Those are really our only mapped floodplains associated with streams. Yeah. I'm asking more because the county lost its FPA and, and we have been talking about trying to borrow assistance from perhaps the city. Sure. Um, well, that's an impressive I, workload. I was going to say, I think the city has enough workload as it is without farming out. No offense, Scott, but I know that Everybody just kind of deaf ears. Um, All right. Do we want to move on to the MFTE presentation? Yes. And I do apologize for skipping the last page. Oh, no, no problem. All right. So um, I'm going to share just uh, a document. This is something that I prepared this week. So before the city council repealed our multifamily tax exemption program, we granted a tax exemption to the uh, Pottery Creek Pottery Creek Apartments Phase 2 project. This is the new apartment project that's almost done just east of their phase one project next to Fred Meyer. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're they're getting ready to start marketing their apartments for rent. And just, just because we said maybe we would revisit MFTE someday, I wanted to share with you what the rents and income limits are going to be for this project because I had to confirm these numbers with them so that they can try to market their affordable units 
uh, separately from their market rate units and make sure that they're not advertising them for too much uh, money because the rent has to include utilities. And so according to HUD, um, fair market rent for the different sizes of units, there's studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three and four. We don't see many four bedroom apartments built, but it's there just in case. Um, so the market rate for rent is from $1,300 to $3,181. Um, we require in our agreement that they rent these units at 10% below fair market rent to people earning a, a specified percentage of the median income based on the unit type and their household size. And so um, the developer asked us to consider creating a rental or a utilities allowance. And so what we've determined is that the, the monthly utilities allowance for each unit is about uh, 197 for a studio and up to 293 for a four bedroom based on uh, the utility providers. And all of this information is uh, we, we get from Housing Kits app because they have to track this stuff as part of their housing programs. And so we determined that the that the affordable studios will rent for $1,053. Uh, a two bedroom is $1,608.10. Uh, $1 and so uh, once you, you know, excluding utilities, this is, you know, these are, are pretty affordable units. And uh, when you actually take the unit, so if you have a studio that rents for $1,053 and you rent it to a single person, so a one person household, um, the efficiency unit has to be rented to somebody making 40% below median income. And so this means that the person cannot earn more than $33,000 a year to rent this unit. And um, when you when you actually take the you know the portion of the rent that makes up a percentage of their income, it's it's well below the thirty three percent of income spent on housing, and so these units are are actually pretty affordable for folks based on these income levels, um, at least in the the couple of of examples that I tested, and the project is going to give us eleven studio affordable units, eighteen one bedrooms, seven two bedrooms, and three three bedroom units. So we're getting a total of of 39 units that will be rented below market rate and are reserved for people earning uh, a specified amount below median income. And I just wanted to share that with you so that you knew sort of the, the city offered this benefit to the developer to build the housing. This is what we're actually getting in return and the amount of rent that people will pay for these units and uh, see if you had any questions about it. Do they have the same percentage on phase one? Uh, phase one, Jim, I, I don't believe they, I think they did an eight year exemption and they didn't have to provide affordable units on that one. Is that right, Jim? There, there are affordable units is my recollection. I, I couldn't recall for sure. I'd have to go back and look at their agreement. So they're, um, they have to do an annual report. And because that phase one project is so new, I don't think their exemption started until this year. So I don't believe I've seen the annual report yet. I think it'd be hard to swallow on at least that you know, um, that discount, but phase two, it makes more sense, but yeah, I like it. All right. So finally, um, since you were talking about parking downtown, you, you reminded me of something I was hoping to share if we can do some good of the order. Jay, is that all right? I'm, I'm good with it. So you want to add parking to the list? <laughs> all right. I'm, uh, I got to find something on Google maps here. So I, I don't know if I shared this already, but when we talk about parking downtown and the need for parking, when I was at the APA conference, I went to Minneapolis for the national APA conference and I went to the town of Stillwater, um, Minnesota, and I did a, a mobile tour of, of this city. And it's, it's kind of an amazing place because of the similarities with Port Orchard, because it's on, uh, it's on a river, but it's called Stillwater because it's very flat water in this location. And it's almost like being on a lake, but um, you can see they have this highway here, highway 36 and uh, Highway 36 used to turn north and come through downtown Stillwater before crossing the river into Wisconsin. And then the state went and built this new bridge. And so all the traffic that goes through downtown Stillwater no longer goes through downtown. And it, it's very similar to Bay Street, how we have a state highway going through our downtown. We built our new Tremont project, which allows people to go around downtown. But unfortunately, we still have a ton of traffic uh, kind of congesting our, our downtown. And so I thought it was very cool in terms of how it's it's kind of a similar dynamic to Port Orchard. They actually took this old um, this old road bridge. It's now a, a pedestrian only bridge, and this whole area is closed to cars and is is just pedestrian plazas. 
But the other thing I, I asked them about on the tour, they, they built a parking garage and the entire thing was built um, by bonding future parking revenues. And so the city built this parking structure near their downtown and were able to do a, an economic study basically to say, this is the performa for a parking structure that includes paid parking. They were able to borrow the money to build the facility and operate it as a, a, a municipal parking garage. And it's, it's even built on a hill similar to our downtown where the, you enter at grade from the uphill side and you enter below grade from the downhill side. So it's very, very similar topography to downtown Fort Orchard. But um, I wanted to share that example of, of a, you know, I, I don't know how parking a parking garage is going to ever be built in Port Orchard uh, unless we, you know, um, you know, every time I, if I buy a Powerball ticket, I think about giving a portion of that money to Port Orchard to fix up downtown. But uh, other than that, I don't have a good plan for how how to pay for something like this. And I wanted to share uh, share that with you and just see what you thought. Yeah, I think that uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but we've talked about parking garages before. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to chuckle a little bit because when they converted the old J.C. Penney store downtown Bremerton to parking garage, it was like, yeah, it's like half full, and it's not half full any longer. I mean, it's it's premium parking down downtown with everything. So, I think it's probably something to keep up on the list. You know, keep on the list, and it certainly uh, would not hurt downtown. It's more of where and when, and funding. Yeah. Like you pointed out, Nick. Uh, my Powerball money is going to building a new new elementary or, or middle school. So uh, I'm right <laughs> with you on that one. So, Nick, so you heard, go ahead. I was just saying, uh, I was going to ask, have you, have you heard what the cost of a, a, per, a per stall is on a structured parking? Oh, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I think, um, you know, I, I think back to how cheap construction was during the Great Recession and what huge opportunities we missed to get uh pretty big discounts on things but i i think right. this is the project that you you look at and you map out and you wait for <laughs> you, you time it for when uh you know the labor market is a little bit better um but yeah i think 60 to 100,000 dollars a stall is probably the cost these days that's i i heard 70 is is and it depends on the type of structured parking it could go up yeah but the the cool thing about this town you know ian smith before he left the city he he talked about um you know, wouldn't it be cool if if we could somehow compel people to use Tremont to get, come into Port Orchard rather than coming in along the waterfront to reduce the amount of just throughput in downtown and make downtown more of a de destination yeah. rather than a corridor of, of people who aren't getting out and stopping. They're just clogging up downtown. But I was here in April, which in Minnesota, usually, you know, it could be snow. Um, but they had a sunny day and this place was packed and it was packed with people who were coming to this as a destination rather than driving through it as, as just a, a stop along the road. This is the new plaza they built going to their pedestrian bridge, uh, which used to be the, the the state highway where the state highway turned right here. And it, it was unbelievable to see how activated this place was. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because of the not pushback, but and I understand it, but from the. Um, our store owners and businesses downtown, when we, you know, have an event or something, uh, they, you know, feel like that interrupts their business flow because it's not a permanent uh, uh, function, as as you pointed out, where they make pedestrian pathways that are permanent or yeah. parking. Well, you can you can go to to Victoria and see examples of where they have those plazas downtown, yep. but mm -hmm. you can still drive in a vehicle if you need to pick up that antique you want. Uh, yeah. I also think that once the once the bank is built, it'll kind of ignite perhaps a a shift in what we see in terms of retail opportunities downtown. I've been, yeah. you know, if we ever see uh, Tweetons being built out, I don't even know what the de developer's uh, name of that project is. Um, <laughs> I, I still think that will ignite it. And if I could flip on everybody for a minute, I had a discussion with the. Um, Essentially, the person helping to finance the on the cab, the uh, um, I'll say hostel uh, unit that's going in there uh, for with forty people. That that's going to be coming up pretty soon for occupancy. Uh, they're hoping, I think, for this fall. Uh, I don't know if you if that's optimistic on their point, Nick. But uh, 
I, I see that as being a, a you know, just a, again, a, you know, a little bit more positive uh, for both the portable housing and for people being down, being downtown. So more to follow on that one, I'm sure. I, I'm not aware that the building permits have been issued for that, but I could, I could no. they just be out of the loop. Uh, there's people building there <laughs> and they're, they're moving. They, they probably fast. have permits. I think we would hear about it in that location if they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey Tom. Um, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jay. No, I was just going to say, um, I had one thing on my list uh, and we want to talk about a meeting in August or whether to delay it to September. Uh, my feeling on a meeting in August is, gee, looking at your work plan, I'd like you to continue working and not uh, uh, not spend an hour of, uh, of your time, even though this has been very informational. Uh, the other thing was in September, uh, or if you're going to do it later down the road, I'm okay with that. Uh, I know that the council usually do, does a, a ooh and an awe ah every time you update us on building permits or what's coming down the road. So I didn't know if that you're going to pull that out of your hat at somewhere down the road. I mean, just, you know, like what's happening with some of the big projects, you know, it's always the, the update portion and we always get excited when we see that, even though we know it's uh, coming down the road. Well, the um, I did give my forecast to NOAA for budget, which is more conservative than my forecast that is the ooh and ah uh, variety. So um, I, I could definitely look at doing that sort of presentation. Um, I think that um, we're going to be pretty focused with comp plan. And so it, it's just a matter of getting it updated and figuring out if we have time. So certainly mm -hmm. by the first of the year, if not sooner. Yeah, yeah and, usually, uh, usually do it about semi-annual. So, you know, that's what I was saying. Uh, Eric? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> was there, um, and I could be crazy thinking this, an ER that was going in next to Lowe's? Next to Lowe's? Uh, uh, no, it, there was a uh, multi-care was looking at the site owned by Roland and Roland on the north side of Sedgwick, east of 16, along okay. Blackjack Creek. And okay. I believe they have uh, pulled out of that feasibility because um, Roland and Roland has designed the roundabout for Bravo Terrace. They designed it as a three-leg roundabout that could be changed to a four-leg, but they didn't get approval from WashDOT for a four-leg roundabout. And I think the amount of time that it was going to take to go through the design exercise for a four-leg roundabout there for multi-care was longer than multi-care wanted to wait. Okay, I was wondering if it was kind of a coincidence because um, I just read in the paper that um, um, off Kitsap Boulevard there, there's an ER going in there now. And so yeah. I didn't know if it was just a coincidence on timing or if they pulled out, so I was curious. I think it was just coincidental that oh. that um, Harrison was looking at doing that at the same time that multi-care was looking at moving in. Um, no. I don't know whether the decision for Harrison to move forward convinced Multicare not to pursue it or not. Yeah. I think Harrison's been talking about it for a while. One. Yeah. Just thankful to have one, so. Yeah, no kidding. Scott? Um, well, uh, you know, Nick got to add something to the agenda, so I'd like to add something brief to the agenda, too. Sure. Uh, I, Nick, I'd like to hear about how we're managing signs, and these are the signs that that, you know, I, I temporary, constantly... like the temporary signs. Yeah. The ones that people, you know, post in the roundabouts and wherever they can, the little, yeah. you know, wire framed signs that I, I groan about all the time, but, but can you well, we have me... a website on that? So let me pull it up and I'll share it with you. Yeah. Okay. While you're doing that, are we obligated to notify somebody that we've taken their sign to the graveyard for signs? We are not. No. So our okay. uh, we did that as a courtesy the first couple of times we did enforcement. And and now it's just stated on our website and in code that you have seven days to pick them up. And, um, you know, if we can ascertain the owner, we may give them a call. I know that right after the rules went in, the farmer's market uh, had signs up and we said, hey, we have new rules. And they went and took care of it rather than us uh, pulling their signs is my recollection. But, but are we, are we actively pulling signs if we see them like we are, yes. is driving along? Okay, cool. Yeah, That's what I wanted to hear. So so if you'll recall the temporary signs, mm -hmm. first of all, there's approved corridors. And so temporary yeah. signs can only be in the right of way uh, in this list of streets. Um, beyond that, you also have to keep them um, both set back 10 feet from the curb line or uh, fog line if there if there is no curb. 
and you have to keep them out of intersections. So they can't be within 100 feet of the center line of an intersection or within 50 feet from the curb radius uh, out on a road segment. So we've created this graphic online and uh, that helps people know where they can put them. And so it has to be on one of these streets. It has to be accessible to pedestrians. Um, so if there's no sidewalk, if you can't safely get there to put the sign in, it's not allowed. And then it, it has to be, it can't be within the intersection. Okay. I was yeah. more curious about how compliance is going. Like, are we grabbing these signs as we see them? Because they seem to proliferate. Well, until today or until tomorrow, we are. Um, we lost one of our code enforcement officers. Her husband is military and was relocated. And so yeah. um, we're going to have to hire a new code enforcement officer. So I think that um, we'll still do enforcement, probably not as, as uh, efficiently as we have been. Okay. And then I was going to say for my part, in terms of meetings, August is kind of sketchy for me. Uh, and September maybe as well. Uh, I may be gone for both parts of each of those months. Yeah. I, I would like to go. Uh, what do you foresee, Nick? I mean, I'm I'm fine with not having a meeting in August, uh, September, you know, two months out, you know, waiting three months, there's always something that seems to come up uh, for notification. Uh, I'd like to maybe hold a September one and Scott, we're more, we're pretty flexible, you know, on dates. So if there's some dates that may work better than others, if you could let uh, uh, Nick and Jim know, uh, I go out of the country, not country, I'm in country on the 25th. But uh, other than that, you know, I'm good. I don't know about you, Eric, but we're- I can, flexible. I can make whatever time, uh, whatever time is good for you guys. I can okay. make it work. I yeah, and I can try to phone. I can try to phone in too, depending on where I'm okay. at. So, so here's what I would suggest: yeah. um, our normal September meeting is actually in, in September is unfortunately the day after work study, and so I'd like the land use committee to see the comp plan before it goes to work study. Um, so, is it possible that we could move the September meeting up a week so that it comes to you before it goes to the full council at at work study? Like, could we do September 11th instead of the 18th? Yep, September 11th would work for me, Scott, right now. I, it's up in the air. I'm planning on a trip um, beginning the first. I don't know if I'll be back. Okay. Uh, are you out of country or, I mean, are you? No, so, no, I'm I'm uh, doing a mountain bike trip up and down oh. the West Coast. And so I, I probably can access by phones. Okay. That would be fine. If that yeah. works for everybody. The alternative... Think, um. Jim and I are going to be at a conference the first week of September, but the you said, Jay, you're out the last week of August. Is that the 25th you were referring no, to? Last week of September, I'm out. Oh, okay. So the last week of August could also work if we wanted to, rather than having it on the 21st, we could do it on the 28th. Um, last week in August, I'm at a conference out of state for work. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the 11th would be better anyway, just from a readiness okay. of the planning department to share the comp plan. Why don't we ink that in and and maybe, maybe I, uh, call it, you, Jim? Take your computer with you. Okay, take my phone. <laughs> okay. Take your phone. And and Scott, if you're unable to make it, we could also grab an alternate. Or um, you know, we've had meetings with just two committee members. Before. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, don't not have the meeting if I'm unavailable uh -huh. because I come back and then Joshua, my son, is going off to college, and so I'll be moving him in. Oh yeah. Where's he going? I gotta ask. Sorry. Where's he going? He is transferring to Western Washington. Mm. All right, cool. Nice. Well, Vikings. That's new. Okay. Yeah. Where to go? Um you know, my only thing else is uh have a great day unless anybody has anything. It was a lot of good information. Oh, uh, Jim. Obviously, your work plan is amazing. Uh and go from there. So, I, I just wanted to tell Eric that uh, I looked it up. It was an eight-year exemption, so there's no affordability requirement there. All right, thanks. I love it when my memory works correctly. Mm. <laughs> All righty. Right. Thanks so much, guys. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.